Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. I'm continuing in this series on character studies, and I've about completed the study of Jacob, and now he is known as Israel, and he has these children, and one of them is Joseph. Uh, what I'm doing is uh, uh, studying the characters who are the most prominent. So I'm not going to really get involved in all the other, uh, the 11 children. Uh, Joseph is the next uh, really significant character we find in the scriptures. So from this point, we're gonna move on and really focus on Joseph. It'll probably take a while, there's a lot to his life. Um, now, if you haven't seen uh, the uh, previous character studies, uh, they're already uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher, so feel free to go back and uh, watch those. But right now, I'm going to start off with, uh, uh, it'll be uh, Genesis chapter 37, and it says, And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being uh, 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Uh, now, Israel, this is the name now that uh, Jacob was given by God. When he wrestled with God, God changed his name and said, now you'll be known as Israel, one who wrestled with God and, and uh, lived or um, prevailed. Or, uh, now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. So uh, we know his children as the, the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 children of Jacob, uh, and 11, the 11th born was Joseph, yet to be born is the last one, uh, Benjamin. But right now, he says here that Israel, who used to be named Jacob, he loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. <laughs> Now, I've never had this issue because uh, um, I have one child, one, a son named Mark. He's 35 years old now. And uh, in my family, uh, with, with my parents and my siblings, uh, my parents had five children. And we never got the impression, and my mother always argued that uh, she didn't love ch her children one more than the other. She loved them all the same. Now, ideally, I think a lot of times people will uh, will say that, but I, I, I don't know if people can help uh, maybe preferring one more one over the other. And we know that, uh, for example, uh, the sons of uh, Abraham, you know, his first son was Ishmael. And he was not the son that God had planned and and uh, blessed, uh, and so Abraham, of course, he preferred his son through Sarah, who is um, uh, Isaac. Now Isaac had two sons, um, Jacob and Esau, and Jacob preferred and loved more Esau. Uh, even though they were twins, they were born really at the same time, but Esau came out first. So technically he was the firstborn. And it says clearly that, you know, J Jacob loved him. Uh, he was the preferred son. Um, and then, uh, but then on the other hand, his wife, uh, Rebecca, she, she loved Jacob rather than Esau. So you can see these, uh, it, it seems to be common at that time that not only did they prefer one child over another, but they made it clear. It was not a secret. 
They didn't even attempt to conceal their preference. And in this case, we see uh, uh, Jacob, who became Israel. Uh, he, everybody knows he loves Joseph more than the other 10 children. So I, I it's, when that happens, right, it, it's one thing if, if it's a, uh, uh, there really is a preference, but you try to conceal it and and just and deny it, because but 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 when you actually come out and let everybody know that I prefer this one, he's my favorite. I love him the most. That's got to hurt the other siblings. So, because of that, and I, I think that Jacob is to blame for this, or Israel is to blame for this because um, the jealousy builds up, and it's the fault of Jacob, Israel. Because he made it so clear to everyone that, no, you guys are, you're my sons, but this is my beloved son. This is the one I prefer. And I love him the most. So obviously, that's going to you know, um, cause some um, bad feelings from the other brothers, jealousy, resentment. And it says that he made him a coat of many colors. He doesn't just bribe the coat any more than that, but uh, I get the feeling that this is a fancy coat, uh, something that, and maybe it was uh, a, a, an expense to, to make this coat or have it made. And uh, it was different. Nobody else had a coat like this one. And this was another way of distinguishing him as separate from the others and better than the others. So it's almost like giving him a crown over the family. This coat was uh, was uh, served that purpose. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Well, I mean, it's, uh, it's to be expected. It's predictable. And it's a shame that uh, uh, Jacob, Israel, um, wasn't smart enough to recognize that, or if he was smart enough, I knew that uh, that would happen. He obviously didn't care. But what we find out is that he ends up putting his uh, beloved, most loved son, uh, Joseph, into great uh, risk of his life as the story unfolds. Um, it says in verse 5, and Joseph dreamed a dream. And we're going to find out that this is the first dream mentioned from Joseph, but he goes on in the, his life to have numerous dreams that are very, very significant here. He says, and Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. <laughs> you see, as we find... As the, the the dream is explained here in the next few verses, uh, it also makes me wonder, why would Joseph even tell this dream to his brothers and his family? I mean, isn't he smart enough to understand that this is also going to uh, create even more uh, resentment towards him? Because in his dream, it, it shows that he is above the others. He's better than the others in some way. And that uh, they will end up serving and bowing down before him. So let's, it, it, it seems that if he thought it all out, or maybe in his just excitement and enthusiasm over this dream. I mean, if you had a dream like that, I mean, you might be excited and want to tell everybody. But if you took a little bit of time to slow down and think, you might realize, wait, if I tell them about this dream, they're going to hate me even more. So he said in verse 6, and he said unto them, Here, I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheep stood round about and made obeisance to my sheep. It's not hard to interpret that. 
you know, that uh, the other brothers, the, sh the chief uh, was um, uh, being obeisant or subservient, you know, of, of, uh, accepting that Joseph chief had a superior position that they had, a, they had to, then they respected it. So uh, these sheaves are symbolic for these men, these uh, 11 men. And his brethren said to him, shalt thou indeed reign over us? See, they didn't miss it. They didn't miss the point. It was obvious to them what Joseph was telling them. He had a dream that he was going to reign over them. So they say, and his brother said to him, shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. Wow. So I mean, this is building up to a climax. First, his father clearly shows preference for him. And then he tells them this prophetic dream and it's clear the meaning of it. And so between what uh, Jacob Israel did uh, and, and between what Joseph himself did, then uh, I guess you, you, you shouldn't expect anything else but his brothers to resent him and it even grew to hatred. Uh, verse 9 and he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said behold I have dreamed a dream more and behold the sun and the moon and the 11 stars made obeisance to me Well, this is sometimes uh, prophets get two dreams that means the same thing, uh, explaining it, illustrating it in this, the same point, but in a different way. And so this is really saying the same thing. Uh, and uh, the, the thing I find interesting here, though, is that nobody knows at this point about Benjamin. You see, right now, you've got uh, uh, you've got uh, you've got Jacob Israel, the father. We've got his wife. We've got multiple wives. But I don't know uh, which wife it's referring to, but you've got, so the father of Joseph and the mother of Joseph, and then you've got 11 sons. And yet this dream says, uh, the sun and the moon, which are, we're gonna find that Jacob Israel immediately understands the sun and moon represents, you know, Joseph's mother and father. And the 11 stars made obeisance to him. How could 11 stars make an obeisance to him? There's only 10 brothers. There's 11 siblings, but Joseph's one of them. So he says, 11 stars made obeisance to me. Uh, that means he is uh, 11 plus him is 12. So unbeknownst to everybody else, this really is, is prof prophetic that they are going to have another child. And sure enough, they end up having, having Benjamin. Um, uh, okay. Uh, and he says, and he told it to his father and to his brethren. There he goes again. He can't keep it to himself. Uh, but again, we know that how this will all play out eventually. Uh, and so maybe... It is God's uh, desire that he tell them in the resentment build and the hatred build, and then he ends up having being gone to to Egypt. And and uh, what I don't know if you've read the whole story before, you don't know where it's going. But um, 
So it, it would make sense that him telling them is part of the way of building up this resentment so that they finally do a horrible thing. Um, verse 10, and he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, what is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? You see, so when he told the first dream to his brothers, they immediately interpreted and knew the meaning of it. When he told this second dream to his father, he immediately knew the meaning of it. And he says, What's, what does this mean? Are you sorry to say that uh, I and your mother and your brothers are going to uh, bow down to you? Verse 11, and his brethren envied him, but his father observed the same. Observe the same. Uh, let me see. This is 37, verse 11. Let me see if I can get this in the Amplified and see what it means, if it helps me. Thirty-seven, verse 11. Uh, Joseph's brothers envied him and were jealous of him, but his father observed the saying and pondered over it. So it says, but his father observed the saying and pondered it and thought about it. So um, I don't know. I, I don't see that his father's getting angry and, uh, at, at the way the brothers do. But he is kind of shocked. He's, he's just amazed at this dream and, and the, the possible implications of it. And he's actually considering it. Okay, let me go back to the KJV. Verse 12. And his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said unto Joseph, Israel, remember, is, is Jacob. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here am I. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brothers, and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and came to Shechem. So one thing immediately I, makes me wonder is, why is he not already with his brothers? They're off doing a task, and he's not with them helping do this, whatever work they're doing. Is it because... Uh, his uh, father is uh, uh, giving him preferential treatment, uh, and the, the brothers have to go off and do this work, and, and and then instead of Joseph being participating and sharing the workload, uh, his father sends him out there like a supervisor, check and monitor on him. <laughs> so all these things contribute to this attitude that the brothers are going to have that that uh, the father loves Joseph more. He's he's. Uh, he respects him. He's already having him come and check on us and report back. Or maybe uh, Jacob Israel has held Joseph back because being the youngest and the one he loves the most, he, he's just the most concerned for his safety. He's afraid something might happen to him. Just like, um, I I don't know if you, you who are watching right now, if you are a parent, but... Uh, I pray every day for my son's safety. He's 35 years old. I still can't stop praying for his safety and his health and his and blessings. Uh, but the worst fear I have, and I think the, the parent's worst nightmare, is their children being hurt or dying. So maybe he held Joseph back because uh, of this. Loving him so much, he was just worried more about him, what might happen to him. 
in verse 12, and a certain man found him. And behold, he was wandering in the field, and the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed the, their flocks. And the man said, They are departed hence, for I am, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. This was their opportunity. Maybe, maybe that's why Jacob Israel didn't want his son to be with him alone anyway. Uh, he was worried, but then this time he, he was a little negligent and, and sent him off to, alone to, with his brothers. Maybe, maybe Jacob Israel suspected or realized that his brothers hated him and that they might hurt him. But he sent him off to check on him. And sure enough, Jacob's worst nightmare would come true. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. You know, kind of mocking him and, and uh, demonstrating their disdain for him. Verse 20, Come now, therefore, and let us slay him. I mean, it's just not very normal in a, in a family. I mean, even in my family, I mean, there's five of us. You know, even when I got upset and didn't like one of my siblings, what they've done, I, I never dreamed of wanting to slay them. And yet I just saw the news yesterday. I think maybe it was this morning that there was a family with six children and the two oldest brothers killed. They slayed the parents and two. they tried to kill all four of the younger children and uh, two of them lived. But here, here's two brothers that wanted to slay their brothers and their parents. And you hear about this every once in a while, but it's not normal. How much jealousy and resentment do you have to have to build up to that level of hatred? Where you, they, they all they're all saying, "Let's slay him." There's ten of them. Ten of them that want to slay him. Um, And come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say, some evil beast, beast hath devoured him. And we shall see what will come of his dreams. Well, I think that's one way of stopping the dream. How are they going to have to bow down and uh, show obeisance to him if he's dead? Um, verse 21, and Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. We have 10 brothers that were conspiring here, but one of them just says, no, let's not kill him. So at least one of the 10 uh, was not so full of hate that he wanted to kill his brother. And verse 22, and Reuben said unto them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness and lay no hand upon him that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver, to deliver him to his father again. So I guess Reuben's idea was that uh, he didn't, he was going to stop them from killing Joseph. And he came up with a plan so that Okay, he wouldn't be killed, but he'd be able to put in the pit, and then he'd come back later and get him out of the pit and return him to the Father. Okay? That's what this verse is saying that Reuben was thinking. And verse 23, and it came to pass 
when Joseph was come unto his brethren, that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. And it's like stripping him of his crown uh, that his father put on him as the, the most loved. And they took him and cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty. There was no water in it. So, you know, he wouldn't drown in the pit, but he was trapped in the pit. I'm assuming that there would be no way out of this pit. Maybe it was like an empty well. Verse 25, and they sat down to eat bread. <laughs> oh, God. That's amazing. They do this horrible thing, and they don't even like uh, have any second thoughts, and they just decide to, oh, I'm hung we're hungry, let's eat. It reminds me of what I've seen on TV this last couple of weeks with uh, Planned Parenthood and their uh, their attitude. They, they have these, they caught them secretly on camera talking about selling baby parts from uh, aborted babies. And they're, as they're talking about in great detail about how they're going to kill this little baby of course, they don't. They refer to it as tissue. They're going to crush the tissues just to the right places, uh, so that it's uh, aborted. And yet, the, the organs they want to get out of to, to sell are not damaged. So they're going to very. They're not going to crush the entire baby or use suction to suck out the entire baby and and have it torn into many parts. They want to do it systematically so they can save certain parts to sell for profit. And as they are talking about this procedure and the selling of these body parts, the Planned Parenthood people are drinking wine and laughing and eating munching on their lunch and uh, all the while discussing such a horrible thing. And uh, one of them even said that uh, they're negotiating how much they'd be paid for the body parts. And she just said, well, as long as she could buy a new, get a new Lamborghini, that's what she wanted. But that it's that kind of an attitude. And, and now I see Joseph's brothers, they throw him into the pit. And I guess they're going to leave him there and just thinking, assuming he'll die in the pit. And then they just eat. That your conscience is not even bothered enough that they lose their appetite. Verse 25, and they sat down to eat bread and they lifted up their eyes and looked and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels and bearing spicery and balm and myrrh going to carry it down to Egypt. Ishmaelites. Well, the Ish Ishmaelites are the descendants of Ishmael. And uh, as I said earlier, uh, Ishmael was the first son of Abraham, and he was the result of Abraham uh, failing to uh, have a child with her, his son Sarah, I mean his wife Sarah. And Sarah convinced him that God's promise is, uh, is taking too long, so have a child with my handmaiden Hagar, and then they get, and <laughs> uh, it was not God's plan, but Abraham agreed, this great man of faith, Abraham, he ended up, I guess, not believing God and just believing his wife and doing kind of like Adam, you know? Uh, God told Adam and Eve, don't eat from that tree or you'll surely die. And uh, they both, Adam and Eve, understood that. And yet when the serpent told them, no, that's not true. God told you you'll die, but it's not true. You won't die. So Eve ate of it because she didn't believe God. She believes the serpent. And then uh, Adam ate it too. He didn't see Eve die. And he ended up believing Satan, the, the serpent too. So... 
uh, they, these examples of they've lost faith in God and they were persuaded. Uh, and, and in this case, uh, you've got uh, Abraham. Uh, he let his wife convince him to conjugate with uh, Hagar and have Ishmael. And now Ishmael, this is generations later. So you, Ishmael has these descendants and they're called Ishmaelites. And they're going to go up to Egypt. So it's in verse 28, it says, Then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit. Um, and, and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph unto Egypt. Now, it makes me wonder how it would be possible. Uh, I believe the scriptures. I just believe that uh, uh, sometimes we don't really understand them. Uh, I struggle all the time uh, for almost 30 years now reading, studying, and teaching the Bible. Uh, there's many parts I don't understand, but I believe it and I trust it. And yet, it um, makes me wonder, how is it possible that you can just turn around and sell somebody who's not a slave? Could, could they just say, what if they decided to sell someone else out of their, out of their, brother, their brothers? Say, oh, well, not just Joseph, but I'll also take Reuben, too. And how do, they, how do they have the right to sell him? And how does the other people have the right to, to buy him? And if, if these merchants were going to buy Joseph, well, or, or, and why, why couldn't they just also at the same time enslave the, all the brothers and take them all to Egypt? Why not make them all slaves? Uh, was it just because of the size of the merchant's group was, to, was, was not big enough to enslave them all? Uh, or is just this normal business practices? You can just sell somebody to, to somebody else. Uh, but they didn't own Joseph. Joseph was not their slave to sell. And uh, so a lot of interesting things to consider there. But they these merchants did buy him and take him. And uh, so it says, verse 29, And Reuben returned unto the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and he rent his clothes. So apparently Reuben was not with the other brothers at the time that they sold him to these merchants. Reuben goes back to get his brother out of the pit as he originally planned. He was the only one of the other, all 10 of the brothers who did not really want to kill him or leave him in the pit. Uh, he intended to get him out, taking him home, and when he gets to the pit, he's not there. So he's all distressed, thinking, oh, no, he might, he probably thinking they, they killed him. Um, and verse 30, and he returned unto his brethren and said, the child is not, and I, whither shall I go? And they took Joseph's coat and killed the kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood. It doesn't say here, that the brothers explained to Reuben at this time that they had sold him. Um, but it does, I'm assuming that that had to be explained because it says, and they took Joseph's coat and killed the goat and dipped the goat's blood, the, the coat in the blood to make it look like Joseph, it was Joseph's blood on the coat. And they, uh, they could fool their father into thinking he was killed by a wild animal. So I'm assuming that uh, putting two and two together, we, um, the other brothers had done what they had done, and they explained it to what was done to Reuben, and uh, he couldn't undo it. So he went along with it, and to fool their father, they wanted to 
make him think that Joseph had been killed by a wild beast. Verse 32, and they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, this have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. Ah, what a cruel thing. Not only the cruelty that they did to, to uh, Joseph. All oh, they were going to kill him, and, but they didn't, and didn't kill him. So they, his life was spared, but they sent him off to be a slave in Egypt. And so he'd be out of their lives. And yet they come back and they break their father's heart. How cruel could that be that, that they would do such a thing knowing it would be just, just destroy their, their father. He'd be so heartbroken. <laughs> so they bring the coat and they show it to Israel, Jacob Israel, and so he can identify it. If it was Joseph's coat, of course they they knew he would identify it. It was a unique coat. Verse 33, and he knew it and said, it is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. So that's the logical assumption. No Joseph, just a coat that's torn to pieces with, with blood all over it. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. Now, if you're a parent, put yourself in that position for a moment. Um, and all the while, the brothers watch their father. Um, not torn apart by beast, but but, but torn, torn apart with with uh, sadness, broken heart. And it says he mourned many days. Many I don't know. I don't know if that is like. I I don't think it would be just five days or ten days. It's probably a long time. Many days is it could have been months. Verse 35 And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I will go down into my into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. In verse 36, and the Midianites sold him, that's Joseph, into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's and captain of the guard. So that was verse chapter 37. And uh, at this point, really, Jacob is phasing out of the picture here. We won't hear much more about Jacob Israel. Uh, and he will enter the story again later on. But now it's going to really be focusing on Joseph. And he is really one of the most interesting, great characters and a picture of Jesus Christ. And uh, when he was put into the hole, it is a picture of Jesus Christ being put into it. As Jesus said, uh, as Jonah was in the belly of the well, for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And he was put into this tomb, into the earth. And then we know he resurrected. And, uh, and in this case, Joseph being put into the well is a picture of Jesus being put into the, uh, the tomb. And then when Joseph comes out, we'll find that it's like the resurrection and be, uh, because we know that 
as we go on, even though Joseph will have many, many trials and difficulties, he will rise and, and be victorious, just as Jesus rose and is victorious. So, and uh, just as Jesus is our Savior, we'll find out later on that jo Joseph will become their Savior uh, as the story goes on. Uh, so, chapter 38, it says, And it came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren and turned into, into a certain Ad Adulamite whose name was Hira. Uh, this is not what I want. Uh, verse 38 goes totally into a different place. Uh, okay, we'll go to 39. That's where it picks up with Joseph again. It says, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt in Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard. An Egyptian bought him, uh, uh, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. So the merchants who bought him from Joseph's brothers took him there to Egypt, and he was sold. And the one that bought him was this officer that works for Pharaoh named Potiphar. He's a very powerful, influential, and wealthy man. In verse 2, And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. So just as uh, we saw that um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, it, I, those studies I did, they're uploaded on the channel. You can go back and, and look at those. But uh, each of these characters were blessed by God and they prospered. They prospered far in such a way that everybody knew it wasn't natural. It was supernatural. And, and it's easy for Potiphar in this case to see that uh, that Joseph, everything he touches is like mighty it just turns to gold. So it uh, of course Joseph being a slave doesn't benefit in terms of owning anything. Uh, Potiphar is the one that's benefiting from this, but he recognizes it. Verse 4, And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him. And he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had put uh, in, into his hand. So, I'm sure that Potiphar probably had other slaves, but Joseph rose to a place of of uh, uh, respect and, and uh, authority. Uh, Potiphar put Joseph in charge of his whole house. Everything is like is the, is the, the, the business manager. He was in charge of everything. And uh, everything prospered, so therefore Potiphar prospered. Uh, verse 5. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not what he had, save the bread which he eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored and it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon joseph and said lie with me but he joseph refused and said unto his master's wife behold my master wotteth not what is with me in the house and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I. 
In other words, Joseph understands how fortunate he is. I mean, he could have been sold to a bad person uh, and, and mistreated and, and, uh, with, and had a difficult life. And yet he, he, he's doing very well living in a rich man's house and in charge of everything. He says, in this house, Potiphar's house, he put me in charge and there's no one in the house greater than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee. In other words, Joseph got to enjoy the, the, the living in a, in a, in a mansion and, and with uh, the good food and, and, and the, these, uh, the pleasures of living in that, uh, that place. But he said, he, he lets me have access to everything except for you, his wife, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So, I mean, I know he realizes that it's a, it's, it's, it's a sin against uh, Potiphar. It's a wrong against Potiphar for him to sleep with Potiphar's wife, particularly when you consider how uh, wonderfully Potiphar has treated him. And, but he also said, this is a sin against God. And of course, she's not going to understand that. Uh, the, these, uh, uh, these Egyptians didn't believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, it says in verse 10, And it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. So she was seducing him every day, day after day. He continued resisting her. And uh, so he showed not only integrity towards his uh, owner or master, uh, Potiphar, uh, by not sleeping his, with his wife, uh, but he also resisted the temptation of a man, especially a young man. I'm sure, sure Joseph didn't have any concubines or wives at this time. I'm sure that he had sexual desires, needs. So he did not let that control him. He did not let her, as we study every Wednesday, Wisdom Wednesdays, we study Proverbs, and it talks about the strange woman and be strong and resist the temptations of this strange woman. Well, that's what he's, Joseph is doing here. He continues to resist her, her offers and her seduction. Verse 11, it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. So there's no witnesses. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. So I guess it's uh, the type of clothing he had. If, if someone grabs your clothes and you try to run away, the, the garment could easily come off. And then I'm assuming there, I don't know how many garments he had on, and perhaps he was, ran away naked, or perhaps he's uh, it's just the fact that his one of his garments she has. But uh, that's how strongly he resisted her, even at this point, even when no one is around. There's no other men in the house. There's no witnesses, and that's why that's why it's wise to. Uh, never put yourself in a position where you're alone with someone that where uh, you could be falsely accused of something. Never go into a room unless there's witnesses. Never close a door and be alone with someone because when you come out, that person could accuse you of anything. And that's what happens here. So he's in there alone with her just long enough for him to get caught by her and he pulls away but she has his garments verse 14 
that she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in an Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. God, this is really evil. I don't know. Have you ever been falsely accused of something? Doesn't have to be like uh, attempted rape, but uh, just anything. And you you knew that you were innocent, and someone was absolutely making up a lie about you. Has that ever happened to you? What's happened to me? And it's it's a it's a horrible position to be in. Uh, sometimes unavoidable. But sometimes it's possible to avoid these things by just making sure you don't go to the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, in verse 18, and it came to pass, as I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled out. And, and it came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, after this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. So, it seemed like Potiphar was a, a good man in some ways, but uh, he, he immediately accepted what his wife said. Maybe he just thought he had no reason not to believe his wife. Maybe he didn't think his wife ever lied to him. And maybe she's a very dramatic and great actress. Uh, but immediately he's angry with Joseph. That's assuming, he's assuming that this is a true story, that Joseph actually did this, not putting, taking into account the history of Joseph, how he's always conducted himself. Verse 20, and Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. Now, there's nothing said here between these two verses, or at any point, Potiphar gives Joseph a fair hearing. Maybe Joseph did try to explain what really happened. Maybe Potiphar asked Joseph to explain, but there's no indication in the scriptures that that happened at all. It's, it sounds like he just believed his wife and immediately had his guards throw Joseph into prison without even having a, a trial or asking him for an explanation. Putting his wife and Joseph together and hearing them both, and trying to judge what was correct. No, he just immediately believed his wife and then just reacted immediately and threw Jew and Joseph right into prison. Twenty verse twenty one, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. So no matter where Joseph goes, the Lord is with him, and the Lord is giving him favor and, and uh Blessing him. In verse 22, and the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners. Here again, wherever he goes, he gets put in charge. Immediately, people recognize that he's different. Everything he touches, he has success. So the, the, uh, the, the, the keeper of the prison. He, could see, he saw right away that, hey, this guy's being blessed. I'll put him in charge of things. And therefore, you know, my job will be easier. And the better things go, you know, I'll get credit for it is probably what the way he thinks. And verse 22, and the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. So Joseph is like in charge of the prison now. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. Now, verse 23, 
The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Okay, so that's the end of verse chapter 39. I'm going to end it here, and I'll pick up uh, verse chapter 40 uh, next time. But uh, yeah, it's a uh, this family, uh, as just as God promised originally to Abraham on several occasions, and then to Isaac, and then to Jacob, and and now you see that Joseph is being blessed. This he would bless this family line, and uh, because he wanted them to continue, and eventually from that family line, we would get this Savior Jesus, who is a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Jesse, David, Jesus. All right, let's, uh, I want to take just a moment now before I close. Um, when I talked earlier about that Joseph his life is kind of a picture or shadow of Jesus's life that would happen. How he would be left for dead, dead in this, but raised, be raised out of the well. And Jesus was died on the cross and then buried, and he was raised from the dead. And G Jesus is our savior. Well, Joseph eventually becomes the savior of all the Israelites. That will be put down the road as we get through this. But um, when I say Jesus is the Savior, what does that mean? Uh, man, every, all humanity, every person who's ever been born after Adam and Eve was born with a birth defect. Adam and Eve were perfect, and then they, through their free will, chose to not believe God in the garden. Instead, they believed the serpent. And this was the first sin, the sin of unbelief. They didn't believe, and therefore they ate this forbidden fruit from this tree of knowledge of good and evil. And he sins. They didn't think they died, but the instant they didn't believe God, they died spiritually. Uh, physically, they lived for hundreds of years, 800 years longer, I think. But that day, their spirit died. The, their spirit was connected to God. When they didn't believe God and they committed that first sin, God had to depart because sin was a barrier. The spirit of God had left, and now they are here with a dead spirit. They have a body and a mind, but a dead spirit. And all of their offspring were born with these same, the same characteristic. It's genetic, a genetic defect, a birth defect. It's called the sin nature. We're sinners by nature. No one has to teach anybody how to sin. After you're born, it's just a matter of time. As soon as you're able to think clearly and make decisions, you start doing bad things. You start hitting people and taking their stuff and money as a small child. Every one of us have done it. Don't deny it. The Bible says that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every person. Now, I know that some people sin more than others. I mean, it's obvious that some people are better than others in man's sight. But the Bible says the very best person, the, the righteousness of man, is like filthy rags in the sight of God. So you can try to judge other people if you want and say, well, I'm not as bad as them. I'm, I'm a pretty good person. And that's a really bad person over there because they sin a lot more than I do. I know I've done some bad things, but they do a lot of bad things. Or you can say, well, the type of things they do are really bad. And the type of things that I do, they're not really that bad. See, it's, it's not, the, it's not the, the type of sin that's the issue. It's not the number of sins that's the issue. It's just the fact that we're all sinners and therefore we're separated from God. Our spirit and God's spirit cannot connect because 
we have sin on us. Sin has to be removed. Now, all the religions of the world, even the religion of Christianity, I'm not talking about Christianity. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is just a person who has uh, put their faith completely on Christ, who relies on Christ for salvation. It's, it's a faith relationship. That's Christianity. Uh, but Christianity, uh, where people get religious and any time people think that they can do religious things and somehow earn favor with God. And if they do enough good things, even though they got some bad things, but they do a lot of good things, but the scale tilts in their favor. And God says, okay, they're pretty good. They, they met a certain standard of goodness. I'll accept them. But the problem is, God says the standard we've got to meet is perfection. He says, yeah, if you want to go to heaven through your own merit, you could do it if you'll be perfect. But what we all need to understand is, as Jesus said, with man it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So if you're trying to get through heaven through your own efforts, you'll fall short. Because no matter how many good things you do, it won't be enough. And no matter how many good things you do, you still have the bad things, the sin. The sin is a barrier. So God knew that man was in a hopeless, helpless situation. There's nothing man could do. You could join all the religions of the world. You could become the most religious person in history. And in man's sight, they might, everybody judge you as being really a good person, wonderful, the best person. But in God's sight, all your good deeds are like filthy rags in his sight. It has no value because you haven't met the standard of perfection and you did have some sin. So you can't be with him in heaven. God realized our situation was hopeless. He needed to intervene. We needed an intervention from God. And that's what he did. Jesus Christ is... God Almighty. God is a triunity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and Jesus is God Almighty that's in heaven, and he decided, God Father sent him and said, go down there, become a man, so you can die for their sins. You can pay for their sins. And Jesus, willingly, he says, I came down from heaven. He said, I came down to give my life as a ransom. So he willingly came down and became a man named Jesus. And he said he did it so he could give his life as a ransom. A ransom is a payment made to set someone free. What did he set us free from? A guilty judgment. Because he died on the cross and all the world's sins, all your sins and my sins, everybody who's ever lived, all of our sins were charged to Jesus. The Bible says he became sin for us. The man who had no sin at all, who lived a perfect sinless life. All our sins were put on him. He suffered and died on the cross, therefore paying for all our sins. Now, your spirit and God's spirit can unite because... There's no sin barrier. He paid for our sins. But we only get the unity with God. We can only connect with the Holy Spirit. We can only receive the Holy Spirit and have our spirit brought to life through Jesus Christ. You see, even though he died on the cross, <laughs> that story doesn't end there. After three days, he raised himself from the dead just as he promised he would. And then for 40 days he lived there, walking around in the flesh, showing himself to hundreds of people, eating with them, having them touch him, proving he had a bodily resurrection, proving he has power over life and death. And then Jesus says, if you believe in him, if you believe that he is God Almighty, who died for your sins, who has power over life and death, can give you eternal life if you want it, and if you come to him for it in faith, 
trusting him for it, believing in him for it, reaching out as he's reaching out to you and embracing him, your spirit and the Holy Spirit are connected. And now your spirit's brought to life. The Bible says it's quickened, regenerated, born again. Now you're born again. You're a child of God. And Jesus says, well, I have you in the palm of my hand and no one can pluck you out. He said, man, no wise will I ever cast you out. And he says, even if you have no faith, I will remain faithful. I will not deny myself. So no matter what happens, Jesus has you. Even if you start misbehaving, you're not the perfect child. Or even if you say, oh, I have doubts. I have doubts. I don't know. I don't believe. He won't let go of you. He remains faithful, even if your faith wavers. Isn't that wonderful? That's what I mean by being saved. Jesus saves us from this judgment of guilty. Instead, we die and we go go for God and we're not guilty. We're his child that he loves and we have eternal life in heaven. Now, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Jesus paid those wages. He died for us. So, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He says it's the gift of God. It's a gift. He's offering it to you right now. And a gift means that you don't have to pay for it by making contributions to charities or paying tithes to a church. Or you don't have to pay for it. It's a gift. You don't have to work for it like doing religious types of works to earn it. You can't do it that way. You have to just accept it as a gift. Accept the fact that he paid for it with his blood. He did the work by living a perfect life. He suffered and died on the cross. He did everything. Just believe in him and who he is and what he's done for you. And accept this gift of salvation and eternal life. Will you do it? I hope you do. If you do, put your faith in Jesus today and make a comment on this video. I'd love to hear that good news. Thanks for watching. I'll pick up the next chapter next Sunday. And join me on Wednesdays as I go through the, the book of Proverbs. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.